<laughs> Fantastic. Um, hello and welcome to this talk um, by me. I'm Laura, I'm a content designer at HMRC. I'm also a UX writer. Um, I work with app developers mainly, uh, working on microcopy for, for apps. Um, just some housekeeping for today. Um, if you have any questions, there's a chat box that you should see. Um, and it's moder moderated by Rachel, so she'll be there to jump on any, any questions you have um, about audio and things like that. But if you want to drop me a question specifically about anything I talk about, then please do. Um, you can also post your questions after the talk um, in the Write the Docs Slack channel. Um, hashtag, hashtag North England. If, if you're not already part of the Slack, um, if you want to sort of message myself or Rachel, we can add you. Um, it's a, a kind of worldwide community of, of tech writers and content designers and the like. Um, um, really, really useful, really helpful. So if you want to be a part, please let us know. Um, you can tweet me as well. It's Laura Parker UX. Um, if you could please mute your microphone, that'd be great. Uh, we had a, a wonderful parrot or, or bird um, chirping away earlier, which was really enjoyable. Um, but yeah, if you could just mute your microphone, that'd be really helpful. I've research, uh, sorry, I've linked all the research um, in the document so you can explore in your own time. And I'll upload the slides to Speaker Deck after the talk so you can have a browse through. And we're recording too, so feel free to watch back if you need to. Wonderful. Can I just um, leap in um, and say, a welcome from um, from Write the Docs to everybody. Course, this was supposed going. to be um, this was supposed to be a live meeting. Obviously, we're not able to do that. Um, we are going to try and continue to to meet um, over the coming months. I think next month's meeting is is book club. Um, I don't know if Deborah's planning on doing it remotely or whether it's cancelled. Um, but I'll be looking to organise something for. Um, Oh, Deborah says no. Book club is cancelled. Um, <laughs> in which I, I'm going to try and put on another remote thing um, at some point while we are in confinement. So if you would like to speak, um, please get in touch. We always need speakers, um, and we are a very gentle and um, supportive audience, I would say. So. Um, if you have anything to say at all that you would like to share with the community, then we are absolutely here for that. OK, Laura, carry on. No problem. Thank you. Um, OK, so this problem, how do we make software human and relatable, is something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, we use software all the time. It's part of our daily lives. If you have a mobile phone, a laptop, computer, you interact with software and a lot of us um, interact more with our phones than we do our family which in some cases is quite sad but also I guess if you um, uh, need assistance if you're um, if you have a disability it's a good thing so the kind of ebbs and flows of technology have really opened my eyes to and I guess for in the future, I, I I always kind of think about what what's going to be the future. How will software play a bigger role in our lives? So this is the problem that I've been thinking about, and I guess it's kind of the problem I'm going to try and answer today, um, hopefully. And it starts off um, by I always use this example. A lot of my family members don't really understand what I do when I I tell them I'm a content designer or a UX writer. They seem to think I'm Either they ask me if I'm writing a book or they just shake their head and literally understand. So this is an example I always show them. And, and this is Minesweeper. And it's about how you get from the left to the right. Um, so it's the same kind of thing. It's you're asking the user if they want to exit. But I think this is a really clear example of how using things like plain language um, and just being able to easily suggest to your user what the two options are without overloading them with too much information. And it's all about this kind of idea of keeping a beginner's mind. Um, if you work with developers or, or software engineers or people who, who make products and services, sometimes you can get too much into it that you forget what it's like to be a new user. 
Um, so again, if you're spending all your time creating your product, learning about your product, writing about your product, you seem to miss some of the subtleties and some of the things, of, some of the aspects of what it's like to be a new user. Um, what I'll talk about in a moment is this, this idea about being an anxious user. But this point is really useful, which is a new user might be anxious about using your product. I, I don't know about you guys, but I, if I download an app um, or go into a website, I can't instantly figure out how to use it. I delete it quite, quite quickly or it'll sit there on my phone and I won't go, go back to it. Um, so that's what I mean. That's what I mean about being anxious about using something. You you want you want the knowledge and information straight away. And if there's something that's stopping you from getting that information, it's it's kind of really poor a poor user experience. There's this idea as well about the curse of knowledge. Um, so the more you know, the further you are from the beginner's perspective, which is why user research is so important. Um, especially as a writer and I know testing things like software and UX is, is, is really good but I'm really interested in the kind of language that people kind of gravitate to and, and, and how we can use language to help people of all ages, of all um, socio-economic backgrounds to understand the same thing. And this last point is really important as well. So users have existing expectations and behaviours um, so, for example, a burger menu on the right hand side um, is quite popular. So if you're, if you're designing, designing a product or an app or website and you're using different methods that aren't used normally, it's going to be harder for your audience to navigate um, so that, because they're so used to seeing things in, in everyday life um, in, in ways that people use. Um, technology. Um, so I guess this is really important as well, which is, is how we read. So in order to really write well, we must first understand how we read, I think anyway. Um, so these are some points that I've kind of discovered over my career, and I'm sure you're probably aware of, of some of them. Um, so our cognitive load, so our mental efforts, so basically thinking increases 11% for every 100 per, uh, words uh, that we actually read. Um, some people bounce around when they read online. And I'm sure you might be familiar with how we read online versus how we read um, offline. So for example, a book. When you're reading a book, you're more likely to read um, left to right. Whereas online, your eyes kind of bounce around everywhere as you're following your cursor. Um, our brains can kind of drop 30% of text and still understand. Um, so what that means is as we read, especially if you're skim reading, you'll look at the shape of the word. And um, some, some of the shapes are really obvious. And what your kind of brain does is it understands what the shape of the word is without you actually thinking about it. Um, however, it's, it's kind of worth noting that some people with learning disabilities will read letter by letter. Um, they don't bounce around like some users or most users do. So that's particularly important uh, when thinking about things like information architecture. So how you structure your web page. And again, people with moderate learning disabilities can understand sentences of around five to eight words without difficulty. So, so we really try at uh, HMRC and, and gov.uk to keep our sentences as short as possible. And um, it makes it easier for them guys and it also makes it easier for everybody else. And um, the Gov UK recommends you write for a nine year old reading age. Um, I don't think that's a recommendation adopted by everyone, but that's certainly Gov.UK's um, recommendation for us writers who work within government. Those are our kind of standard guidelines. Uh, some of you may have seen this as well. This is called a saccade, and this is a saccade rhythm. Um, so again, it goes back to my point I made about our brains kind of guessing 30% of the words. Um, so our eyes don't see every letter in a word, um, sorry, every word or, or every word in a sentence. So we actually skip around um, in small jumps. And you can kind of see here the illustration of the red circles. 
And um, after each saccade, our brain takes a snapshot and arranges the letters into words, and these are called fixations. And as you see the rows below, you see how the lines blurry, and then slowly the words come into uh, into show there. And that's kind of what a saccade rhythm is. And what we can do is we can help our readers to kind of skip um, the, the 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 language by using what's called a, a high frequency word. Um, so a high frequency word would be something like coat and a low frequency word would be outwear. So a high frequency word you use kind of every day in normal language, low frequency not so much. So I wouldn't ordinarily say please grab me my outwear or outdoors wear. I would probably likely say please grab me my coat or I'm, I'm going to grab my coat. The next point I want to make um, is this idea about being empathetic, but also fun. And um, so I write a lot of microcopy. Um, and microcopy sits on on apps mainly, but also on websites as well. Um, and that's kind of small snippets of information. If you've ever filled out a form and uh, you in, you've incorrectly put the wrong thing in the form and it kind of flashes up red and says um, something like incorrect information. That's the kind of thing that, that I write. And depending on your brand, um, you might add humour to that. Um, so I know that like, um, for example, I think it's Just Eat or something like that. Um, they have a really, their tone of voice, you see, is really humorous, but sometimes it can get in the way of um, of your message. I'm going to go into that a bit more, but what I want to look at here is um, why you should get to the point. Um, so this this kind of links together with empathy um, because a lot of the time when I, when I talk about accessible language, people say, oh, but I'm not um a disabled so i don't it doesn't matter about that or um i'm okay i can read everything but in actual fact um accessibility benefits everybody so um what i mean by that is um people with poor internet connection busy people people with physical injuries um for example if you've broken your arm uh you might have to use your phone in your uh, left hand that you don't usually use uh, which means that you're actually impaired that way. And for example, if I'm writing some instructions, I want to be able to write them easily with plain English so that person can easily navigate through doing what they're doing. People with children as well are, are, are kind of uh, more likely to be preoccupied with doing something else. And then there's roughly kind of 25 people or 20% are living with a disability in the UK. But actually, not all visibility is visible. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen these posters. They're great. They're from the UK Home Office. Um, I've got here designing for users on the autism spectrum and designing for users with anxiety. Um, and they kind of illustrate do's and don'ts. Um, now, these are kind of design focused, but there are a few bits in here, for example, um, don't use um, idioms or uh, sort of like figures of speech, I guess. So, for example, if you were to use um, slang or um, a metaphor for something and, and someone with autism is, is reading that, it might not translate in the right way or the way that you want it to do. So, again, it kind of comes into the humour. So, a lot of the brands that I have worked with before have tried to put in, for example, puns or jokes um, or kind of wordplay into their comms, into their instructions, into their kind of UI, um, which I I personally think it's a bad idea because you might be isolating some people who don't, don't quite understand um, those things. Um, and we've got here on the anxiety side, um, we've got certain things like make help and support easy to understand or easy to, to get to. So this could be um, if you're writing 
um, a web page, for example, um, this could um, be a big button with help or something that navigates people to the help center. I know a lot of the websites that I've worked with, their help center is, is usually hidden. It's not easy to find. So making sure that the help center or contact details or anything that is really easy to, for people to find if they're a little bit anxious about um, using the service. I mean, I work for government and a lot of people who, who contact government are coming to do a serious thing. Um, so that's why it's really important that we make sure that help and awareness is really easy to spot on the page so people don't get frustrated having to look through multiple pages um, to find what they want. There's a link there for you to download these. Um, I've got these printed out actually. Um, in my office and I'm really great. A slightly different take on the same thing. This is Microsoft's accessibility. Um, kind of, you can download this. It's like a, a accessibility pack, I guess. Um, and it's really interesting because what they put here is people who don't really have a disability, but might otherwise be impaired. Um, even on the right hand side, down to weather. Is there glare from the sun? Is it windy? Is it cold? We all know what it's like to use our, our, our phones and it's cold, when it's cold and our hands are numb and we're trying to navigate our apps and websites. So these are all really good reasons why um, using kind of uh, inclusive language and making sure that our our services are as intuitive and as easy to understand as possible. Um, just because we go through life every day and there's things that we're not 100% dedicated to our laptops and our phones all the time. We're nearly always doing something else. Um, and this is a really good example of, of Microsoft and how they kind of look at accessibility as a whole and, and think about every user type. Again, these can be downloaded and I really do recommend that you do. Um, and I couldn't resist putting these in here. And this is the, the Action Deafness campaign. Um, these are just some posters that I uh, stumbled across when I was doing my research. Um, it doesn't really relate to, I guess, what we're writing, but um, it's just really good to see this kind of advertising in, in the, out there, really. I always wanted to share these with you. And, um, you know, we're talking about other disabilities. Let's not forget. Um, uh, people who are hard of hearing as well. There's just some kind of rounding up points about balancing empathy and human here. Uh, sorry, in humour. Um, let's have a moment with the reader. So, when um, someone purchases something and they go through the fill out their card details and they click buy or purchase. After that's made, there's a little bit of anxiety about, oh, has my payment gone through? Or, and and, and it, almost people are waiting for a, a confirmation. Um, so this is a, a point where you can merely have a moment with your reader because they're relying on you to tell them that what they've done is correct. So in this instance, you can be a little bit humorous or you can put some, you know, you can, you can include your tone of voice at this point. Um, we want to be able to keep a beginner's mind, um, so we want to go. It's, we want to skip the what and go directly to the why. Why this is useful? Um, it's, I guess it goes back to features and benefits that that's been around for a long time, and it does still still stand. Let's use some simple everyday language as it helps everybody, um, especially those with visual impairments, dyslexia, or anxiety. Um, someone with a uh, someone with an eyesight problem, for example, um, might be really hard for them to just see in general. It could be painful for them. So if we're looking at um, some instructions or maybe um, some text on a website, if we can reduce that down and still have the same clarity, that's going to help that person um, and, and kind of help them to understand as quickly as possible so it hurts them less. And again, people don't find the same things funny. So if you want to be humor, if you want to be humorous in your microcopy or your instructions or whatever content you're writing, it's kind of risky because not everyone sort of finds the same things funny. Um, I think the big brands that do it well probably do a lot of, of user research. 
Um, so in the intro, I, I talked about this kind of thing about information anxiety. Um, so I'm just going to talk about what I mean by that, I guess. Um, I'm sure you're all aware, but there's a lot of moments of doubt and anxiety to deal, to deal with, um, especially when you're using a product or service you're not familiar with. And some examples might be, um, oh, when you're trying to log into something, you're like, I can't remember my, pass my password. Did this website really save my changes? Um, was my shared document sent? I do this all the time with them when I'm sharing like a Google Docs um, and you can, there's an option to kind of sh share the link, but you want to, people to be able to edit it. And I ha have this anxiety about when I share the link and I'm like, did I, did I click the right option? Um, and then if you have a pop-up notification, then it goes away. You're like, how do I get it back? Um, so these, this is what I mean by kind of information anxiety. The small sort of micro actions that we do when we are engaging in software that might cause us some anxiety. Um, especially if, for example, the purchase one's quite a high anxiety um, informing action because you're actually parting with something, you're parting with your money, so you want that confirmation. And that is why you do receive confirmation when you have done something like purchase something through an app or through a website. Um, and it's our responsibility to make this process easy to understand and, de and delight our users. Um, but it's, as long as it doesn't get in the way of, of clarity. So we want, first of all, to tell the user, this is an action you need to do. Congratulations, you've done it. And then you can be funny or witty or punny. Some examples, um, just to illustrate what I'm talking about. You know the Netflix and BBC iPlayer provide options um, for people to turn off the countdown timer. Um, you know when you're watching a series on Netflix and you're kind of binge watching it maybe, and it says uh, five seconds and there'll be like a timer at the bottom left, at right hand side. You can actually turn that off. Um, and I think the reason that is, is because for someone who may be anxious about trying to make a decision about what to watch or something like that, it's just not very nice, not very nice user experience. Um, so you can turn that off, by the way, if, if you dislike that. And we've got Monzo here, the banking, the bank, should I say. And um, this is an alert. Um, this is not my alert, but this is what it will send you. Um, so it, it notifies you that you spent X amount and it asks you to review the purchase, which is quite a, a nice little micro message there to just say, oh, hi, you spent a lot at an hour that's not popular. Can you just check these purchases to make sure that, you know, there's no fraud or anything like that. And then on, on, the, uh, on the right, we've got this, um, this thing. This is actually me on um, Hermes chat box. <laughs> trying to find out where my package is. It's a little bit of an extreme example, but every every time they updated the waiting time. So as you can see there, it goes from eight minutes to six minutes to two minutes and so on. And I was kind of curious about this. I was watching this and even though it was a bit annoying, I kind of felt, well, actually I do just let me know how much I'm going to wait because it could just say you're in the queue or um, someone will be with you shortly, but that doesn't really give me a direction of, of how long I'm going to be waiting. Whereas I thought this, this was quite a good example and it could relieve some of anxiety I might be feeling, especially if I'm frustrated, which I was. Um, <laughs> the third point is, and a really important one, is, is knowing your audience. Um, so who are you talking to? Um, to understand your audience, you should know how they behave, what they're interested in or worried about. So your writing will catch their attention and answer their questions. And also very important is to understand their vocabulary. So what, um, sorry, so this, what terms are they using and phrases are they using and which ones are they likely to search on things like Google? Um, to track things like this, it's a really good idea to use Google Trends and also forums. Um, for example, Wilkinson's, which was uh, like um, the, the shop that sells kind of everything, is now called Wilco's. And the reason why it's called Wilco's is because they found out that a lot of their customers, or the majority of their customers, actually called it Wilco's instead of Wilkinson's. 
Um, so that's just an example of how how your audience terminology can actually really shape the kind of service and product that you use. So if you're if you really want to have a deep dive about who your audience is and and kind of what terminology they're using, I would really recommend using forums um, and Google Trends as well. Um, a lot of what I do um, is writing for specialists, so I'm part of the API um, platform team at HMRC. Um, that involves writing lots of documentation for web developers. Uh, so I thought I'd include this in here for you all today. Um, so according to our research, people understand complex specialist language but do not want to read it if there's an alternative. Um, so just because I can understand the complex term and I understand what it means, I would prefer to read something that's a little bit easier. And the reason that is, is because of the third point I've listed here, is that the people with the greatest expertise tend to have the most to read. So as I, uh, earlier in our talk, I explained that, um, oh God, have you forgotten? <laughs> oh, just because, um, accessible language, you might not need accessibility, um, accessibility benefits everybody. Um, so because I'm, even though I'm an expert and I understand all the terminology, it's going to be easier for me to read something that's written in plain language because I have to think less about the language. Basically, that's the point I'm trying to make. Um, technical terms, I'm sure we all use them throughout our work. Um, they're not considered jargon. Um, but we should explain what they mean and not kind of um, assume that our users will know what we mean by our technical, technical terms. Um, point four then is working with designers. Um, and the reason why I've called it the most important working relationship you will have is because you share a lot of the same problems and you need answers to the same things. You ask roughly the same questions as well, and you obviously work together. And so I, in my experience, I found that um, some of the best projects I've worked on have been the most collaborative, where the designer and myself has have worked collaborative, collaboratively together, sharing ideas, sharing feedback, um, being kind to one another. I know there's lots of kind of... Um, Tit for, tit for tat in the writer versus designer world but ultimately we all work together to say it's sort of um, for the same purpose really and there's this as well which is most designers have never worked with a writer and um, so it's kind of up to us to set the standards here and um, it's kind of a big claim <laughs> I don't really have any evidence for it but um, I think predominantly for the most part especially when I work with um, app developers, it appears that not a lot of just dev, devs or designers do actually work with writers very closely, other than just looking at a Word document anyway. So I thought I'd include some tips for you. Um, this is just what's worked for me. If you've got um, a great working relationship with your designer, then just um, keep it as it is. Um, I like to give my designer a copy in advance. Um, and kind of consider the design deadline as well when I factor in how I'm going to work. Um, I don't really like using Microsoft Word. Um, I do get stick for that. Um, I just, for me, I don't like how it looks. Um, I find the kind of the tabs and things a little bit distracting, so I use a different word processor. Um, most designers as well don't use Microsoft Word every day, so it might be good to look for an alternative that might work better for the both of you where you can both collaborate together. Um, at HMRC we have content crits um, and design labs and these are held every two weeks where everyone could come along. It's an open forum for everybody. Um, for the content critiques um, called content crits, I take along a copy, some, some copy or um, or uh, maybe some research and it's critiqued by other members of the team. Um, feedback can only improve your work, so I believe that sharing is a good idea. Um, in these content critiques, we kind of say to one another, it's not personal. Um, 
and obviously the the advice doesn't have to be um listen to if you choose not to no one's going to be offended basically and let's celebrate them their moments of greatness as well i know some designers who write really well and who have helped me as well to write better so if you do work with a designer um it would be good to to collaborate better together than to make a you know make sure your work is as, as best it can be Okay, so back to our problem. How do we make software human and relatable? Would this be the answer, maybe? And um, this is just a recap of what I've spoken about today. So we've got keep a beginner's mind. What's obvious to you won't be the same for your audience. Make sure you're doing your user testing. Even if it's asking your partner, friend, mom, dad, uncle to just read over your content just to get a kind of different perspective straight away. Um, and make sure your audience feel less anxious by using things like high frequency words. So remember that's something that we use in everyday language. Um, let's be empathetic, but let's be cautious with humor. And um, to really be inclusive, we need to be using plain language. That's even for experts. We've got humor is risky, especially if it gets in the way of clarity. If you're, um, you've got two children, it's raining outside, you're trying to look at your bus timetable and someone's trying to be funny about the weather, that's not really gonna go down well. I just want my information as soon as possible. Uh, let's, you have to know your audience. Um, so understand who is reading your content. You need to work out who the actual audience members are. Um, there's a really good example of this in terms of um, children's cereal. So a lot of the cereal brands will appeal, appeal to the children, but it's actually the parents who have the money. So they actually have to balance who they cater, who they promote. They want to be seen as as healthy for the for the adults, but also appeal to the children. So the end user end user is actually the parents, not the children. So it's a really interesting example. Um, use words that your audience use, not words you think they use. So do your research, go into Google Trends, see how your audience relate to your um, sector, software, service, or whatever you're doing. And work better with designers. Um, it's not them and us wearing it together. Pair up, host design clinics, and get some content crits on the go. Um, it's, they're really fab. And just before I finish, I wanted to go through some gov.uk standards that we kind of abide by, I guess. Um, <clears throat> in no particular order, and I've just pulled out some random ones which uh, are my favourite. So use specific verbs. So when we when we write a call to action. It has to be quite specific and a little bit friendlier. So we use connect or save as a you know, instead of set up or manage. Um, we use Google Trends and forums to check that they're the, for the terms that people search for so that we show up on not only Google, but we're also helping people understand what we're talking about. When referring to a date, we use today, yesterday or tomorrow. This is quite a simple one, but I really like it. Um, People don't really say the date when they refer to the, the day before. I would say yesterday. Um, I wouldn't say a date. Um, avoid long blocks of text. A really good kind of tip is if you're writing, send it to your mobile phone and view it on your phone because we all know that people um, read more content on their phone, but it actually looks less on a desktop than it would do on a phone. So if you send the work to your phone, you can actually see where you might need to separate out your sentences. A good rule of thumb is one point per sentence of about 25 words and two points per, per paragraph is kind of what we try, tend to stick to. And uh, use inclusive language. And I've, I've kind of linked this up here, um, words to avoid when writing about disability. And that's a really huge list. Um, so I'll send this out, you can have a look at that as well. Um, you might want to screen grab this page, but also it will be in the speaker deck. Um, some people to follow and some, um, some other industry uh, standards and rules and some links to, links to click as well. Um, notably the WACA guidelines, readability guidelines and the, the gov.uk stuff I've been um, talking about. And uh, that is it from me today.
Thank you very much, Laura. That was brilliant. Um, please type your questions in the chat if you've got any, but I've, yeah, I've got yes, one too. Yeah. Oh, sorry, did you say there weren't any or there was? Um, well, I, I've got one for you um, okay. while, while everyone um, gathers their thoughts. Um, I've recently been um, rewriting a lot of UX copy. Um, we've been we've been working, you know, broadly along Content Design London kind of principles, gov.uk principles, yeah. or I've been trying to. But the feedback that I'm getting from the um, from product managers and actually from UXs is we don't like this. We it's like um, if because I've been trying to sort of shorten the sentences, simplify the language. The the feedback I'm getting is that this is a bit terse. It's um, um, you sound really abrupt. Um, is that something that you've had? So I find I find that when I get when we have our sort of content crits, they put all the sort of pleases and thank yous and are you sure you want to do this and the, the, the things that I consider to be fluff words and can be removed um, they all get put back in um, at feedback time um, and, and we're kind of at a bit of an impasse in terms of the the kind of trade-off between brevity and simplicity and I guess warmth maybe um, is that something that you can that you have experienced and what can we do about that yeah i do you know it, it, it differs from sector to sector so definitely um in, in government it would be it would not be seen as being tar, um, harsh because and um, we really just need to read the reader to understand when mm. we're not in there we're not in it to be funny or to be well honest. that's my that's my view i work i work on a really dull b2b um business intelligence project uh, product you know it, I'm we're not innocent smoothies we don't need to be, <laughs> exactly but I have trouble sort of um, um, getting that over to the um, the people that I'm, I'm working yeah. with I don't know if there's um, I think what we're typically advised is to kind of bring the evidence so bring what we know about readability um, to, to the people we're trying to persuade, but that's a real struggle at the moment. It is, it is, and, and in different sectors that I've worked in, especially FMCG or your B2C, um, I definitely struggled, and what would happen was I would strip out the words and they would just end up getting thrown back in. Um, it really is down to, to kind of, yeah, almost like educating your, your stakeholders or the people who make decisions, and um, I think it, if it, it's your tone of voice as well like if you if you can get into your tone of voice document something about accessibility you might mm. find that people agree to it a little bit more um, yeah. something that I've done in the past is actually made accessibility guidelines for the company um, you know not nothing nowhere near as complex as like um, Content Design London or the Gov stuff but just a, a simple maybe two pager which outlines how we write for all audiences and in there trying to get something about being um obvious and um yeah never assume well, anything don't yeah. even get me started on accessibility i'm gonna stop talking um <laughs> and let everyone else talk so uh, we've got some great questions here um how do you know what a nine-year-old reading age is and what words do these include um, yeah. I guess there's things like Flesh Kincaid and um, those sort of readability tests. What what else? Um... Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, again, it, um, how do you know? I think I don't know the answer to this question, but what I do know is that you can be helpful from what i've learned from gov.uk is things like using the the high frequency words that we were talking about um and and using plain english and and explaining if you're using a technical term explaining it and also checking out other organizations like content design london as well it's hard to gauge because some nine-year-olds might have a really high reading age, but I think it's really in there to just illustrate that when you take the readership as a whole, which could be 
people with disability, it could be people with um, English as their second language, it could be people with visual, Im visual impairments. It just that the it's not dumbing down, it's opening up is, is Sarah Richards kind of um, soundbite there and that's really helpful. So I don't know if there's a way to measure if you're hitting that readership age or not, but what I can do is I can have a look back. A really good link to check out is this one here, which is the uh, gov.uk guidance content design writing for gov.uk. There's loads of information in there, um, so I would definitely check that out and I can definitely follow up with you if you leave um, an email address. One of the other things that you, you could consider is um, there is the, simp if, depending on the domain that you're working in, the simplified technical English standard um, is... Yeah. I mean, it's a very, very kind of hardcore and restrictive um, standard, but it's it's um, specifically aimed at um, the kind of maximizing um, understanding and minimizing, particularly minimizing ambiguity. Um, yeah, yeah. So that that can be if. For, for certain domains, that can be really helpful as well. Yeah, this I think Word, Microsoft Word has a it has a um, well, it's called like an eligibility checker or accessibility checker and it will give you a score it gives you a readership score um, you might just have to research uh, which score you need to be hitting but I know it does have that functionality there's also a website called Hemingway which is um, a grammar checker and there's also Grammarly as well I'm not endorsing these these companies but they but, do yeah have somebody access. shared Hemingway in the chat so thank you for thank yeah, you for yeah. uh, Deborah um, okay we've got loads coming so I will um, I'll try and get through these uh, so no that we don't miss if, any um, um, I'm good on time but if we if we do start running out of time then I can always if you want to copy and paste them um, I can pop them in the northern the the, the channel on the um, slack but yeah go ahead okay brilliant um, so next one what advice would you give to a UX designer if they don't have a writer to help where would you say to start with writing within the design process? Are um, there any yeah. tools for a designer to use to help with this? Oh, that's a, that's a great one. Yeah, that's a fantastic question because actually a lot of the microcopy is written by designers because they have no one to work with. Um, so I would suggest um, checking out. I can, can you see my page still? You can everyone see? My page on here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would definitely start with um, places like um, the Content Design London, and also the the Gov website that I keep referring to. I would also uh, follow Sarah Richards. She's great. But also look at some books now. Um, I can't really recommend any UX writing books, but I do know there are some UX writing books that have been written by UX designers. There's um, a book called Microcopy by yeah. Yemit, is it Yemit Kifra? I don't know if I've pronounced her name. I, yeah, I yeah. haven't read any of those books, so I don't want to endorse them, but I do know that they do exist. I've, um, I've read I've read the Microcopy one and it is okay. very, very good. Um, very, very good. Um, but I wouldn't just limit yourself to uh, reading about UX copy in general, maybe look at um, copywriting or writing. Just broaden your copy skills because a lot of the time, if you if you kind of pigeonhole yourself, it's a it's a lot harder to to learn the skills you need. So I, I would I would recommend um, pairing up with someone. So um, if you can um, join the Write the Docs group. Um, you know, even just message me directly. A lot of the time, pairing up is a really good example of of learning. Um, because a lot of lot of UX ex, uh, designers do have to write a lot of the copy, so I do feel there should be more of us around um, to help. And if if anyone wants to volunteer to kind of um, help this person or um, help other people, other designers, um or if they know of any other resources to please pop it in the channel or the, the Slack group as well. I'm sure, yeah, we'll be able to, to think of loads. Um, so we'll definitely do that. Cool. Uh, so next one. Um, do you gather feedback from the audience to make sure you're getting it right? If so, how do you gather feedback? 
Yes, we do. We have what's called a user lab. Um, so we'll have people come into the user lab, which is um, almost like a, a setup, like a dummy setup where they have a screen and a computer. Um, and this will be led by the user researcher and whoever wants to be involved. So it could be me, it could be the service designer. And um, we will ask them to go through, for example, if it's documentation for the API, we ask them to go through the journeys um, and we monitor their, what they're doing. And if they stumble, for example, if they um, pause when they're going through the research, we'll ask them why and try to probe them as well. The content crits are a really good idea to try and get other people's opinions on it. Um, it's all about iteration, iteration. So again, it's like looking at your Google Trends. It's looking at the forums. It's having a look at how people are searching Google. Because if you think about the way you search Google, a Google search engine, it's not how you would naturally talk. People have learned to kind of search Google in, in quite a, a weird and wonderful way. They might put, if they're looking for um, the nearest pharmacy, they won't put in Lloyd's Farm. Well, some people might, but the majority of people will search for pharmacy, pharmacies near me or, sorry, pharmacies near me or pharmacies um, in location. So it's really about keeping on top of, of how people are interacting with technology. Um, but yeah, user testing, we test everything we do. Um, we have prototypes uh, before it goes live and, and we'll ask, we'll, we'll iterate based on feedback from those prototypes before it goes live. Do you do any sort of more quantitative feedback like a, a feedback button or um... Uh, you know, one of those sort of did we help you today kind of. Um, yeah, um, you see them on the Gov. I think on the Gov site they're 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 testing a lot of things um, in beta, so you probably see those flying around. Personally, I don't really deal with that. I kind of do the the I guess the back end research. Mm. Um, but a, a really good test and something that I've done before is when I've written something is to ask someone who's who's with me. So whether, whether that's a boyfriend or mom, dad, it doesn't have to be the massive research where you have a, a user lab or anything like that. It's just what Sometimes even just there. reading it out loud to anybody yeah, can, can yeah. highlight some of the glitches. Yeah, um, I used to, I don't do this much anymore, but I used to record myself saying it and then oh. have the pain of listening to it. But I've got, I don't know if I could do that. Um, yeah, it, it, it does because it... Obviously, in speech, if you're reading something out and you stumble, it could be um, that the language of use is not quite right or the, length, the sentence is too long or anything like that. And another good tip as well is if, you, if you're if you editing your work, is to send it to your phone and read it on there mm. or to change the font size or the font colour um, just to give yourself a little bit of a different perspective on it. But usually it's really helpful to use um, to pair it with another with another person to ask them to edit it and, and proofread and things like that mm. as well. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do that a lot. Um, uh, so next one. Um, you mentioned getting rid of MS Word. What editor do you recommend for better collaboration? Oh, yeah. So I use a simple text document. Um, so text file. So if you're using a Mac, it's just text file. I'm not sure about the um, the, the other machines, but I also do use Grammarly. Um, I have a paid subscription to Grammarly. Now it's not perfect, and some of the some of the suggestions it makes are just truly awful. But I do like the the layout and the usability of that. So I would just and Grammarly saves everything in like a cloud, so the designer can. We have a login and the designer goes on there and can just grab whatever um, he needs. Um, yeah, Microsoft Word, I mean, I, I do use it when I have to and there are instances where when I do have to. And Google Docs is is um, is good for collaboration as well. But my first kind of preference would be um, a text file. But if you're working with a designer, just ask and if they're happy to use Microsoft Word, then then that's great. But if you want to kind of be more collaborative, maybe just just drop your designer a message and just say, can we explore um, new new software out there that might be be more beneficial for us? 
I'm quite a big fan of um, actually using because uh, our designers use abstract for yeah. their to put their wireframes on. I quite like having the ability to go into the wireframes and and comment. Well, that's great, the, yeah. The, um, but that might not be, you know, it's it's, it's not an option for everyone. Um, exactly. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, things like Adobe Suite and things is, is quite expensive, yeah. and if you you're not and there using are some, it, I think there are some downsides in terms of um, kind of capturing decisions that we've made um, because once a new iteration of the wireframes comes out, we kind of it's not always easy to get the old conversation oh, okay. thread back. So we have a lot of like. Did we agree about this word or, or not? So we're still finding our way through, like how how we sort of how words that we've selected and decided on make their way actually into the style guide and into the guidelines, um, mm -hmm. so that yeah. we know that that's what we decided. Uh, okay, the Monzo example, um, which was the one about you've spent this much money after 10 p.m. Do you feel that message was too long? If not, why? If yes, what would you do differently? Uh, let's have a look. I'll go back to it. So you can tell that that re no, I don't think it's too long. Um, in fact, I didn't actually. When I first saw this example, I, it was from a a kind of list of of, of UI uh, microcopy. Um, what was the question? Sorry, if yes. Why? Uh, if, it's, if you don't think it's too long, why do you not think it's too long? And if you do think it's too long, what would you do differently? I think this is a very good example, and there's not much um, I would change about it. Um, it's very obvious, so it's saying you spent, and then it's just the amount online last night after 10 p.m. So it's been very explicit with the language it's using. It's using not only the, the amount, but also the time. Mm. And then it's giving me an option. Mm. Would you like to review these purchases? I think the only possible word that I might get rid of is online, um, because the important thing is the money that's been spent, and maybe how it's been spent is, you know, if you were really trying to squish it down into, um, um, yeah. like the bare minimum. But it's yeah, that's that's a real kind of um, um, what, what that's a real like we need to get rid of ten characters. So it fits in yeah, the yeah. It, it looks like they've tried to because you can tell that it just fits quite nicely on two lines. So I suspect what would have happened is it would have been longer and they've managed to be like pop it on two. Because um, I don't know if you're aware about orphan words where you just have one word on the next line. A lot of companies try to avoid that. Um, so you see where the 10 p.m. is. If they'd have left out the other sentence, it would have stopped and been an orphan word. Um, so, I mean, I think I think that it tells you that it's online is is quite nice because, for example, if I hadn't been online, I would be thinking, oh, online, or for example, I don't know if Monzo actually, I don't use Monzo, but um, maybe they tell you the shop if you get an alert and it says you spent this amount at I don't know, mm. um. Asda last night, it could it could do that. But um, I think in terms of microcopy, it's it's easy to understand. First of all, it's explicit. Um, I mean, maybe maybe would you like to review purchases a little bit long? Perhaps I would say review purchase or um, yeah, review your purchase. And that's the kind of that's the sort of minimalist Google way, isn't it? And this is the kind of thing that I'm sort of a bit conflicted with with my designers at the moment is is I would be tempted to say review these purchases and they want the would you like would you to like um, yeah I think I think I'd probably drop because I think it's because people are afraid to be seen as rude but in actual fact I think people a lot of the time wouldn't even read they just maybe get to 308 pound and see the word review um but for example, if you do have a disability or um, your eyesight is poor, um, having more words to, to, if you can say it in less than do, is what the mm. kind of thing that I always stick yeah. to. So I think I, I agree think, with you. Mm. Yeah. And I, I, I think it's difficult. It's, it's quite difficult for British people because we say please and thank you and sorry a yeah. lot. Um, and 
and so, so taking those words out does make it feel a bit rude um but yeah. in other language I, I don't know i think in other languages that can come the amount of apologizing and pleasing and thank you that we do can can also come across a bit strangely when you're it's translating into another language yeah. so i know cool. that um sorry to interrupt i know that on the gov site and in hmrc in general we we've dropped thank you from for example if you're making an application it just says application sent it doesn't mm. say thank you for sending it doesn't say please thank um, you for sending us your tax return does it say that oh no goodness. no it doesn't but oh no no i thought i thought the... you were going to i thought i was gonna eat my <laughs> no. own words then no um, no um i was just thinking it was a funny it's a funny thing for them to be kind of grateful for in a way because exactly. that's your job and their job. Yeah. And, yeah. I think they just they just removed every obscurity they could and just got mm. down to the bones of it. Um, okay. But I hope that I hope that's answered your question. Yeah, I think I would drop. Would you like to? Um, just for uh, well, me, we have a we have a follow up um, okay. about the Monzo example while you yeah. still got it up. Um, how do you deal with responsive screens for copy? Responsive screens. Does that mean like um, like the pop up? Like I don't, I'm not quite sure. So I guess if you're um, if you've got a responsive design that accommodates uh, different screen sizes, so oh, um, right. desktop, okay. mobile, yeah. tablet. Um, um, I guess you could see you would be able to see in your prototype, or um, I think. Clarity is always going to be a winner, isn't it? So if you can't get your message across in the space provided, it's, we would usually cancel that idea out. Um, but you could edit it. So, for example, perhaps Monzo put, would you like to review these purchases in this kind of layout? But in another layout, maybe they just had review your purchases. Um, so I think definitely be flexible when you're looking at how much words or, or the word limit um but definitely clarity trumps everything else Tr clarity trumps politeness um so if you want to say would you like to if you want to say please and thank you by all means do but make sure it doesn't get in in the way of of what the reader really wants to know which is in this example the price and i guess the time they've they thought it's important and i think what might have happened is mons has probably user tested this um, so in order to come up with the, the amount and the time, they've probably gone through different iterations to see what the users actually wanted to know. And that could be why it references online um, as well. So there's always these things going on in the background. Um, but it's a really good question that, um, it's made me really think about this example. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? If, if you think of something, um, Twitter at Laura Parker UX and also um, there's the Slack channel as well. You can always pop something in there if you think of something in a little while. Brilliant. Um, Perfect. Yeah, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff that um, we could probably continue to talk about over on Slack. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much, Laura. That was really interesting. Um, no, thanks for having thanks me, everybody. You you can't see the you can't see the chat thread, but lots of thanks coming through. Um, oh, okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, there. Oh, Deborah would like to mention that we have. Um, although we're not doing the book club in person next month, there is um, kind of an ongoing book club in um, the Slack channel. Learn tech, learn tech writing. Um, so yeah, we can. Um, we can do book stuff there. Uh, I will try to get something sorted for another remote session um, while the great shut-in is happening. Um, <laughs> if anybody has a, a talk they'd like to do, then um, please just get in touch on, on Slack. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all soon, if not in person. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me, you guys. It's been great.